Hello, everyone. Today is Thursday, February 4th, 2016, and this is the Week in Charts. Once again, the Week in Charts is brought to you by me, by my trading service, more specifically. You can get started for just $47, and uh, we'll take a look at the portfolio towards the end of the presentation. And you can go to my website. Oop, left off a of W. I got chopped off. www. If you don't know that by now, maybe you shouldn't be trading. <laughs> JayFlanchery.com slash trading service. And right now there's a banner ad up on the front page. So check that out, and I appreciate it. There's a schema screen, as I often say. All predictions are about the future. And a lot of stuff can happen between now and then. All right. Um, recently, but my wife gave me a little bit of a nudge to get around to catching up on my accounting, and I hate doing accounting. It's it's my least favorite part of my educational and consulting business, but I love my educational and consulting business because it gives me the opportunity to travel the world. It gives me the opportunity to do shows like I'm doing today, which I absolutely love. I guess I'm a bit of a, a ham. I guess we all have a bit of an ego here, and I feel like I have good ideas that I think worth spreading. But uh, if I'm going to keep this educational business alive, then obviously we have to do some accounting here and there. So and doing this accounting, I've I've learned quite a bit about the way people acted last year. And, and the great thing that I love about my educational business, I mean, obviously it makes money and that's a good thing. And I get paid to do something that I would enjoy and probably do anyway. And that's that's the secret of. I think uh, of any uh, or being happy or being in a successful business. So it, it's kind of a great thing. But the other thing that, that it does, which is the above and beyond everything, is two things. One, I get to learn from a lot of other people's mistakes. And it's a constant reminder to me not to make those mistakes. And I think, two is you make me want to be a better trader. So I'm constantly striving to not look like an idiot, to say smart things, obviously, uh, to be right when it comes to the market and so on and so forth. But getting back to the mistakes that people make, one thing that I'm seeing in, in asking people, hey, you want another year of me helping you find some opportunities, telling you to stay out of the market when the time comes, then the conditions aren't there, uh, finding opportunities when they are, and then some general color commentary. Would you like to continue to receive that each day? And at, at emailing people, I'm getting a lot of confessions. Uh, and sort of the, the thinking of today's presentation is going to be a lot about what happens during changing market conditions. And that's going to be kind of the underlying theme today. In addition to the main theme, which is the trading psychology and our psychology when it comes especially to these changing market conditions. But before I digress too far, I received a lot of confessions. I held on the longs too long. I over leveraged. I over traded. You said for months not to do anything, but I did something anyway. I sought action over opportunity. And I'm going to come back to a lot of these confessions in, in just a minute after we cover some of these things. I confused the need to be right versus making money. And this is the big one that I see quite often. And early, early in my career, especially once I started putting out public commentary, initially I found myself kind of chasing my own tail. I was trying to always predict the markets. I was trying to always look smart. And then at one point I realized I'm just killing myself doing this. Just look at the big picture, see what's going on, and generally trade on the side of the trend. And that's where the big arrows came from early in my public commentary. I day traded when I should have just stuck to position trading. And that's a big one, too. We're all kind of have that siren call of overtrading and day trading, 
especially if you have the luxury of sitting in front of a screen all day. You feel like you you have to do something. And we'll get to that. Through going through this process, it reminds me that we're not made to trade. There are psychological and physiological reasons why we really aren't made to trade. The market and trading markets more specifically goes against a lot of our psychological makeup and also what's kind of interesting, our physiological makeup too. As I've talked about before, I wrote a column a while back about the amygdala. The amygdala is a small part of our brain and uh, there's a little bit more to it than just a little the little almond shaped part that you're seeing here. And it's called, uh, the whole system I think is called the, the limbic system. And it's a really good thing for us because it's, it's what keeps us alive. It's the emotional part of our brain, the snap quick decisions. Should I get out of the way of this cab that's speeding towards me? Or should I stand here and, and contemplate my navel and say, oh, it's yellow, and I wonder if that cab driver is having a good day and all this other stuff. So it's a flight or fight thing that helped us in caveman times and even in more recent times if we take a walk in the woods and we're confronted with a bear. Or, again, if we're something happens in more of an urban environment. So... The problem is this little emotional part of our brain makes these really snap decisions and it can really mess with us when we go to actually trade. And again, I wrote about this quite a bit. And the secret is trying to slow that down a little bit so you're not making these snap decisions. And then that's, that all comes to planning and following your plan, which will beat that horse on yet again. So, this little part of our brain, it really affects our decision-making process. Unfortunately, we can't live without it. As I've said before, Shul, Damasio have talked about people who have, have this part of their brain injured. And they say, well, you got to remove your emotions from trading. You can't remove your emotions from trading because every decision has an emotional consequence to it, down to whether I want a glass of water or a Diet Coke or grab a Mountain Dew or whatever. Every decision you make, Every moment of your day, every second of your day has an emotional consequence. So you have to embrace your emotions and realize that this little part of your brain can really have a big impact on your trading. Another thing that sort of goes against the human nature is that we have this propensity to make sense out of things. And you have to remember that the market is made up of a bunch of emotional participants and your job is to look at the charts and read the emotions of others and capitalize on the emotions of others while also keeping yours in check. So everything I do has a psychological basis. If we're talking about a trend knockout, then we're looking for A, a strong trend means that there, there, there are people buying the market. There is demand in the market, okay? In the case of an uptrend, strong uptrend, ideally a persistent uptrend, meaning that there's buying day after day after day. It persists. And then we're looking for a big knockout move, a big thrust lower, a thrust lower that's going to shake out some of these longs, especially the Johnny come lately, the so called fast money, the people that are just getting in towards the end of that trend or what appears to be the end of that trend. And they're immediately at a loss. And those are the people that will screw you the most when it comes to the markets, at least initially, because it'll, it'll knock you out in many cases. And then the shorts, as a general statement, they're more of a trader type, but they also really like to be right. Okay. And I think the shorts tend to have a bit of an ego about them. And I don't know why that is. And I guess we could probably, maybe that's a, we could sit around and drink a couple of beers and talk about that. I guess it's because, uh, they're betting against the market, and they think that the, the sheep are stupid or the masses are stupid. I don't know what the reason is. 
But the shorts tend to pile on, and, and they do tend to confuse the issue with facts because a stock might be very high and have zero fundamentals. But the point is that the market is made up of a bunch of emotional participants. And if you can read the mind of the market, then you can trade using charts. Unfortunately, though, there's not necessarily a lot of logic when it comes to the markets. Now, in our lives, we a lot of what we do revolves around logic. Engineers don't build the bridge upside down one day. There's a logic to how they build the bridge. There's a logic how in physics to how materials work, obviously. There's a logic to being a doctor and performing procedures in a certain way. But you got to realize that you have no control of the markets. Now, the media will make you think that there is sort of some sort of logic at connecting the dots. And if you go back just a couple of years, the market was falling on rising oil prices. And then just yesterday or day before, actually, the market was going down on low prices. And these are actually these are actual headlines. So the connecting of the dots simply does not always necessarily exist in the markets, even though the media will have you believe otherwise. A big problem, especially in more recent times, is our propensity to think what you see is all there is. And this comes from thinking fast and slow. And it's interesting that it quoted Tlaib in this. Tlaib wrote a book, um, I think it was Fooled by Randomness. And Tlaib suggests that we humans constantly fool ourselves by constructing flimsy accounts of the past and believing that they are true. And I think the problem with that is, with what you see is all there is, if you just come into a market like 2015, you think that it just sort of chops around and goes sideways. And you think that's all there is. If you came into the market in 2008, I'm sorry, 2009, and you've held on since, you believe that the market always goes up. Tries to shake you out every now and then, but you can't get out when it tries to shake you out because it just goes up. At least that's what they say on the radio when they're trying to sell you a mutual fund. The illusion that one has understood the past feeds the further illusion that one can control, predict and control the future. That's straight from thinking fast and slow. So we see something and we make this observation, but we don't know that there's possibly that so-called black swan out there. Now, Tlaib, to those of you who aren't familiar with uh, Tlaib, you probably should read his book, Fooled by Randomness. Tlaib basically says, just because you've never seen a black swan doesn't mean they don't exist. And I had a black swan show up in my pond one time, and I was having some difficulties uh, with the fund I was uh, working with. And it's kind of uh, ironic that this black swan showed up. I kind of wanted to shoot it. And just about a week ago, it's kind of interesting. I have a neighbor across the street, and, and they moved in long after this uh, black swan showed up. But a neighbor across the street has some white swans, and he also has some black swans. So black swans do exist. If you've never seen one, I can assure you they do. I have personally <laughs> experienced them in the markets. So just because you've never experienced a big market downturn, doesn't mean that it doesn't exist. So my kind of take on this is that'll work until it don't. Whenever the market goes sideways and chops around, and I've seen this, I've been through several cycles of this through my career, such a the, my public career, I should say. I had a little bit of a private career in trading um, on the institutional side, probably a little bit more on the institutional side when I first uh got started, but that also became public really quick after I published my first article in 1995, which sort of led to this uh, educational business completely by accident. But anyway, 
throughout that career of interacting with people, which is a great thing, by the way, because I get to see other people make some mistakes and it reminds me not to make my own. And I'm not perfect. Trust me on that. Maybe I'll talk a little bit about how imperfect I am later on. But a lot of times people will say, well, you know what, Dave, I've given up on this trend following. I'm just selling options out of the money. And I'm trying to explain to them, look, the market has been choppy. That'll work until it don't. Then they'll try to explain to me why it works. I've seen people many years ago, and I haven't heard from one individual I can think of right now since. But he was had a little option strategy where your reward was about one and your risk was about five or ten or something ridiculous. And he was pretty successful with it. And I kept trying to tell him that that black swan could always be just around the corner. So a lot of times I'll say that'll work until it don't. Now let's let's put this in perspective. Let's go back and look at 2015. And 2015, as you know, was a pretty choppy market. But it sort of just went up and down and up and down. It's somewhat of a very cyclical and rhythmic cycle. And if you're selling options in a market like this, It'll work really well, again, until it don't, when you have a big slide like this. I don't know what you call that, a big two standard deviation or whatever the case may be, a three standard deviation move. And that's sort of Tlaib's whole point is that, or certainly something that he's kind of backed into, is that, as I often preach, markets aren't normally distributed. They don't adhere to statistics. If they did, then whoever knew the most about statistics or the biggest computer would own the markets. These large moves like this are not statistically based, but they happen. So a lot of times people will end up with this permanent income hypothesis. And that could go two ways. What you see is all there is, or you could even go further back with that. And you can go all the way back to 2009. Like I said, quite a bit. Anyone who bought stocks since 2009 is now beginning to get a little concerned. At least they should be getting to wake up a little bit. Now that this perpetual money-making machine is begin to lose, beginning to lose a little steam. In fact, it's kind of interesting. One thing that I've been talking about lately in this, I'm always talking about the Johnny come lately is when it comes to psychology of the market. And the Johnny Come Lately's are going to be are going to be the most fickle traders. They're going to have the least amount of staying power. And it's kind of interesting. I got a call yesterday from someone, and they're like, "Dave, um, where can I learn more about the markets?" And I'm like, um, "DaveLandry.com." <laughs> and you know, it kind of made me realize, as simple as I keep things and put things or whatever, maybe I do need. To, to get around to doing that very, very, very simple course that boils it all down to the to the very utmost essence of what is a stock, what is a trade, and how it all works. But before I digress too far, she was a little concerned because she started investing in 2015, and especially since she has these high fees she's paying, she's underwater by quite a bit, and she's really looking at these fees. And she's really beginning to question these investments. So that's someone who just bought in 2015. And again, it comes back to the psychology of the market. So she bought somewhere in 2015, or let's just say throughout 2015, and now she's underwater. Well, as the market drops more and more, more and more people will be underwater. So everybody who bought here is still happy. But as soon as the market drops below that level, they're no longer going to be happy. Okay, so buy and hold will work until it don't, in spite of what everyone preaches. I don't want to turn this into a why buy and hold doesn't work speech, which I did buy that domain <laughs> for what it's worth. It's a bit of a sickness with me buying these domains. But it won't. It, it'll work until it don't. And trading that choppy market where the market just goes back and forth and back and forth and back and forth will work until it don't, okay? 
So you got to be careful not to get caught up in this permanent market hypothesis. Now, another problem that I often see and deal with on a daily basis, this is this is probably one of the most common one, is being undercapitalized. Now, this sort of goes against human nature, and this is the problem with, again, trading. If you're not making money with little money, what makes you think you'll make money with a lot of money? Well, it's complicated because let's say you want to try something out. You don't go full force in and throw all your money at something. Maybe you just try it with a little money, see if you like it, and then you try a little bit more, and you go from there. And usually that's a pretty good idea. Unfortunately, in trading, being undercapitalized can, can be detrimental to you from both a financial and a psychological standpoint. Now, I have a friend named Karen, who's the wife of, of a good friend of mine, a good friend, and uh, she's a good friend of my wife. And she has a, a bad habit of, and I, I've actually coined the phrase, caring, Karen-ing you, Karen-ing you. If you, get, if you get to know me and <laughs> find out that, like you have a little idiosyncrasy, I'll, I'll use your name and put the I-N-G, uh, like my brother-in-law, he tends to, he tends to Andy you. And so if he's a, uh, He'll, he'll tell you, he'll ask for your opinion, opinion about something, then he'll tell you why you're wrong in your answer to his opinion. But that's another story. But the caring you, she tends to tell a morbid story right before the entree is served. Now, in her defense, she doesn't always do this. It, it, it's funny. If she does it one time, and then I, all of a sudden I, I coined the phrase. But she does tend to tell a morbid story right before the entree is served. It kind of like womp womp, and it, it makes her husband very – very angry when when she does that, but it's kind of funny to watch it all unfold. And and now we actually joke because right before we get ready to eat, my wife will think of something that happened that was unfortunate. And she goes, "Oh, not to Karen you, but well, not to Karen you right before you're ready to have lunch here." But this gentleman to your right here is, is Nick Raj. He's a good guy, um, nice guy. I met him down in Australia, and I was on a panel a panel a panel with him. And he told a very interesting story. Undercapitalization came up, and he told a very interesting story, which was kind of a bummer because I couldn't tell my fart joke afterwards. But that's another story altogether. And he talked about a good friend and began to get a little choked up. He talked about a good friend of his who was trading, and he was trading successfully. He was making money. Unfortunately, he wasn't making enough money because he was undercapitalized. And I think the story went on, not to really care on you, but I think he was like a single parent, had a young daughter, and I think he decided to, uh, well, I know he decided to check out. I don't know the rest of the details. But here's someone who was actually successful, beating the odds, but because he wasn't making enough, decided to check out. So a couple of thoughts come to the small account. If you are trading a small account, we all have to start somewhere, okay? And that's okay, but realize that it's going to be tough to get the money management right, and your frictional costs are going to be a little bit higher, commissions and all. But like Nick pointed out, there's also a little bit more to it than that. And on the flip side of that, let's say you have – a $20,000 account and you lose $10,000 through the trading process or through this aforementioned difficult reasons of trading a small account, well, you're going to feel pretty wiped out. But if you have a million dollar account and you lose $10,000, then that's not as big of a deal. Or as like Nick's friend, if you're trading uh, a small account, and let's say you make 10% on that account. Let's say, um, let's say you make 10% on a $50,000 account. So that's $5,000. Well, that's not a whole lot of money if you're trying to also live off that small account. So from a psychological standpoint, you might feel like a failure. But if you make 10% on a million-dollar account, that's $100,000. Now, you're not going to live high on the hog, but there's a lot of places in the United States, obviously, you could live on $100,000 a year. And a lot of people seem to do so just fine. 
with a lot less. So the point is that you can't let the psychology of a small account get to you. And it seems like with small accounts, from what I, especially since what I've seen last year, is that people with small accounts, when they begin to lose on that small account, and it seems like percentage of account lost is fairly high, that's when it tends to automatically turn into this gambling thing. It's no longer a, well, let me learn how to trade, starting with a small account, being maybe see it as kind of tuition while I learn. And by the way, if you are going to trade a small account, you need to kind of see it more as tuition because it's going to be tough. Okay. So, but what they do is when they start to lose from a psychological standpoint, it tends to become more of a gambling thing. Failure to plan is probably one of the biggest things that I see in trading. And even if they, you do plan, failure to follow the plan, as we'll get to in one second, is even worse. But let's just talk for a second about failure to plan. The reason people fail to plan in trading is because the moment you put a plan in place, you automatically admit that you may be wrong. We don't like to admit that we're wrong. Any of you guys in here married, any of you girls in here married, <laughs> you know, <laughs> you don't want to tell your spouse you're wrong, okay? You don't want to admit you're wrong. It's tough. So the moment we make that plan, we have to come up with a part where we're wrong or we might be wrong and we'll get out. Also, by the way, every trade is going in badly. Like George Carlin once said, I know I say this a lot, but I'll say it again. When you buy a pet, it's going in badly. Every trade will end badly. Now, sometimes it could be a good problem to have. For instance, you might get stopped out at a nice big gain, okay? But in the end, you will give up some of that trend. You will give up some open gains. And that's just the fact of life. Or you might actually lose in the trade. I'm one of the few guys out there that says, hey, you know what? You could lose trading, okay? So failure to plan is a big problem because a lot of people feel like the moment they make that plan, they have to admit failure. And they don't want to admit failure. But what's interesting is people plan in life for some strange reason, but not when it comes to the markets. And I guess... If you didn't plan in life, you wouldn't be successful. You have to plan in life. Everyone has a plan until they get punched in the face. I'm often quoting Mr. Mike Tyson about that. So if you do make a plan, then you have to follow the plan. But the more you plan ahead of time, the easier it will be to follow your plan. As Montier said, and... Um, What's that little behavioral science book or whatever? He talked about how when how stress is created. And two of the things that creates a lot of stress is uncertainty and changing conditions. So what does that sound like? That sounds like the moment you get into the trade or the moment after you get into a trade. So you take the trade. Now you have stepped into the unknown. You have stepped into the uncertain. So if it's uncertain or the information is changing and both of those things come into play, and then, then that's when it becomes tough to follow the plan. That's why you have to have that plan in place to begin with. Everyone has a plan until they get punched in the face. Until you start getting beat up, it's pretty easy to follow that plan, provided you have one to begin with. Uh, I often say I've never met an unsuccessful paper trader. Now, I did have one gentleman come up to me in Dallas, Texas, a few years back and say, hey, Dave, I'm going to be your first guy that's unsuccessful. I'm like, wait a minute, uh, really? How long have you been trading? You know, two months or three months. I forget what it was. Like, okay. Time out. <laughs> that doesn't count. I'm assuming that you actually studied a methodology long enough to realize or, or to, to feel like you have a viable methodology. And you might even have a viable methodology and become successful as a paper trader really soon. 
It's just that your methodology hasn't fit the market just yet. But anyway, everybody has a plan until they get punched in the face. So you have to plan as much as you can while conditions are static. While you're after, while you're sipping that cup of coffee at the end of the day, looking at your charts, and the market is closed, and all information is known, and everything is static. This stock's at a pretty good looking uptrend. I see this little knockout move, this little pullback looks pretty good. I'm going to get in here. I'm going to put a stop here. I'm going to trail a stop a certain fashion in a certain fashion I might let that stop open up a little bit but I have a pretty good idea how I'm going to do that and I'm going to take partial profits at this certain level and then all you have to do which we'll get into in a few minutes is follow that plan looking for action is probably the the biggest problem that I see and sometimes I joke, and what it's funny, you know, I, I, I need to stop doing this, and you know, here I go again. <laughs> sometimes I'll write my column. Whenever I write this, I'll lose, I'll lose several subscribers, and I probably, I probably need to quit. But it's like I can't help myself. Uh, if you're looking for action, I say just go have an affair. That way, you're gonna lose half your money, and then obviously it, it strikes a card with some unfortunate souls who have tripped and, and stuck something where they so, shouldn't have, and. Um, I see people drop off the newsletter, so I guess I need to stop saying that. Uh, as I said before, if you're looking for action, go to Vegas. At least uh, they're a pretty girl bringing you a drink. And uh, who knows, you might actually get lucky. But it is gambling, obviously. But at least in that form of gambling, it's entertainment, provided that you're disciplined and you, you have a set amount and you see it as entertainment. And it's kind of fun, okay? I, uh, I occasionally will throw dice. But I know that the odds are against me, but it's fun. And it could be streaky, and you can get on a streak, and you get on a roll, you get on a hot table, whatever. But I know there's no method to the madness. I just enjoy getting out, knowing that it's a little entertainment. It's some action. It's something to do. I often preach to a lot of people that trading done properly can actually be quite boring. And I've actually had some people that have, have come to that realization, too. It's like once you start following that plan, there's there's less and less of this, what do I do, what do I do? To get into good, get this, that, that excitement just kind of goes away, and it actually becomes boring. And by the way, the reason I travel the world and write and do webinars like I'm doing today, not just because I like it, is because it keeps me busy. It keeps me from firing off day trades. It keeps me from micromanaging my trades instead of following the plan. So I put this mechanism in place. I know me. I seek action. If I'm sitting on the couch at night, hanging out with the family, my, I'm, I'm tapping my foot or, or slapping my hand or something. I'm a little fidgety. I've got to be moving. I have to be doing something. Drives my wife nuts, which is a short trip. But that's another story. She didn't watch his webinar, so I could say what I want. So I know I'm a man of action. But in trading, often there's there's no action to be taken. I have so many unfinished projects around here, it's not even funny. I'm looking at a, a halfway finished desk in my office that I'm building for my studio. You know, it's like <laughs> I have so many projects, it's ridiculous. But I know me, and I have to I have to keep busy. I feel like if I stop, I'll die. And, and so it's, it might be a little bit of a sickness with me. I don't know. But I know I'm wired that way. I know I'm built that way. So I have to put mechanisms in place. I have to keep myself busy. As I often say, busy traders make good traders. Uh, if you're busy saving lives and market conditions aren't that great, what are you going to do? You're going to focus on saving lives and wait until market conditions improve. And I learned that years ago when I was writing my first book back in 2000 or whenever it was. I started writing it. And I was still, maybe I wasn't following the plan exactly right or whatever, but I was still trying to buy stocks even though the market was rolling over. I was getting stopped out, in some cases not honoring my stops. I was making mistakes to a point where I kind of got frustrated and said, maybe I need to back off on this. And I'm too busy anyway. Let me focus on on this book for a little while. And the, the greatest thing happened afterwards, shortly there afterwards, is like I started seeing opportunities more clearly because I was no longer trying to make things happen. Happen, I was letting the market come to me. 
as me going as opposed to me going to it. And then I started seeing opportunities. And I was like, oh, that looks pretty good. I think I'll take that. Click, click, click. And then what happened next was I was too busy to sit there and micromanage it all day long. So I just let the stop take me out. And to my surprise, I stayed with it a lot longer than I thought I would. As I often say, you want to let the market make as many decisions for you as possible. You want to let the market make those passive decisions. So if you get stopped out, just let the market take you out and move on. If you hold on to it, you're like, okay, well, let me just hang on, hang on. It'll come back. It'll come back. It'll come, let it come back. Okay. And then the worst thing could happen is that it goes against you so much, you begin to feel trapped, like we talked about last week. I met somebody in Hong Kong who was down 30-something percent, just like the Hang Seng. And now he feels like he'd look like an idiot if he got out. And now he feels like, whoa, what would happen if the market goes straight back up when I get out and take it to an extreme, you could get into this perceptual distortion or some sort of reasoning that the market should not be going down anymore. The market can do whatever it wants, but you could start reasoning. Oh, well, it's too oversold. I think that's enough. It, you'll start coming up with all these reasons why you should stay in. So, Unless you're Bill Clinton, what is, is. And the bottom line is, and I say this almost, I nauseam him every day, he who fights and runs away lives to fight another day. One of the biggest problems that I see in trading is this attempting to transfer success. You get your undergraduate degree, you go off to med school, you go do a residency, and by the time all of that is done, it's taken, what, four, six, seven, eight, I don't know, 10 years to become a doctor? How long does it take? About eight years at least to become a doctor? It takes a long time. So you feel like because you're successful as a doctor, a lawyer, an engineer, or an automatic transmission mechanic, you could automatically transfer that success over to trading because trading on the surface looks pretty easy. Just buy if it goes up, sell, sell, sell if it goes down. But it's a lot harder than it actually looks. And I know I've kind of flip flop on that. I talk about how easy it is. It's not easy, but it's not as hard. It's not as hard as most people make it, but until you actually do it, you don't know how the psychological aspects are going to come into play so it will take some experience you do have to experience an up market a down market and a sideways market and know how you're going to react to those changing conditions but a lot of people forget how long it took them to become again the professional that they are the perverse thing about trading is the people who are worst at it or the least likely to succeed are those who are most drawn to it. The motivation, the motivated individual who has conquered these other things, and now it's time to conquer trading, has conquered business, has conquered medicine, and now it's time to conquer trading. And again, they forget how long it took them to become successful in their current or prior career. And again, they forget how their current or prior career did take some planning to make it happen. Grail hunting, this is the big thing that I often see. People will trade trend with me for a while, and they'll have some decent success if the market is trending but as soon as that market begins to chop around they'll go out and chase rainbows and system hunt and last year was a great example of that market is choppy and if they're not trying to force something to happen they start trading a choppy market system or start selling options now it's not my way or highway i'm not a big fan of that type of trading but it's not my way or highway. That's what makes a market. I've also had some really bad experiences with some of those things. 
So that has helped to, <laughs> to teach me not to do that. So that's one reason I'm not a big fan of that type of trading. And by the way, the only way to actually profit from the market is to capture a trend. You must sell higher than you buy or cover lower than you short. But a lot of people go off and they go grail hunting and they try to find the perfect system. And the worst thing that I see happen with a lot of people is they start doing a certain – during a certain type of market. I've seen people, believe it or not, start doing bad market – bear markets, uh, bad markets, bear markets, have you want to look at it. I've had some clients come in late 2007 and they just started shorting with me. And they were having a blast and they were thinking, wow, this is fantastic. I love this shorting thing, which is kind of weird because that's really not a whole lot of people short. And that's probably what I'm seeing a lot of right now with my clients. And that's a whole nother story. But I've had some clients come in and they shorted, shorted, shorted. And they're like, Dave, this is the greatest thing since sliced bread. I love this shorting thing. Well, what happened in 2009? Well, in March 2009, the market bottom turned around, sort of going up again. And what do these people do? They continue to short because they have this, uh, what you see is all there is, as we talked about earlier. They think that maybe the market just goes up. Or they hit upon some sort of system during a certain market condition, a choppy market system like in 2015. Maybe 2013 was another year where something like that worked really well. Uh, obviously, just being crazy short oriented uh, everything works better than with trend as I as I often say I've seen a lot of these wave counting types do exceptionally well when the market's trending but when it's not all of a sudden it's always a top and they'll fight a market for years and years and years and then they'll throw in the towel the market will go a little bit higher and then it'll crash okay but they'll be wrong for a long time so obviously there is no holy grail when it comes to trading and that's tough because we think there's got to be a way we could figure this out. And the truth is simple systems can work. I left this in from last week. I just thought it's kind of relevant. Be a lover, not a fighter. Leo Melamed. And in last week's talk, we talked a lot about the psychology of what's happening to people who are just holding on as this market is tanking. And Melamed said, when you fight the market, you rationalize your position is correct even when the market screams it is not, when all the facts contradict your opinion, when your instincts tell you to get out. So don't worry about looking smart or stupid, however you want to look at it. Okay, I can't sell now, I would look stupid. Well, you're going to look stupider if you don't sell now, and then you're down 40 or 50 or, or God forbid, 80%. Sometimes markets go down 80%. Sometimes I'll I'll tell people these kind of things, I'll, like at cocktail parties, I used to say, well, you know, the market can go 25 years without going up, without making a new high. People laugh in my face. I'm like, oh, well, now I'm just like, I just kind of like, mm-hmm, that's nice, you know, <laughs> which is Southern for up yours, bitch. <laughs> you know, but I just listen along now. It's like I'm getting a free drink. Why would I argue with someone when they're giving me free drinks and sometimes food? But don't worry about looking stupid, okay? Sometimes you just have to get out of the way. Yeah, the market could turn around tomorrow, but it might not. And a lot of times I'll tell people if they're down significantly in a position, look, you already have this big loss, whether you take it or not. Why don't you do this? Come up with an uncle point and actually put a stop in place, and you get out of that position no questions asked. Let the market take you out, I should say. And that way, that market makes that final decision for you. Yeah, it might turn around right away, but don't worry about looking stupid, okay? And, of course, my favorite is you're nothing but a trend following moron. And I used to try to outsmart the markets, and I used to try to show you how smart I was. And I had some short-term timing systems. And when the market got overbought, I'm like, ah, it's due to sell off, and it's going to sell off. And a lot of times I was right. But not big in those little uh, little predictions. But I realized you could suit it up chasing your own tail. And so I found it easier just to stick with the trend. And then, of course, somebody said, you're nothing but a trend-following moron. And I'm okay with that. So don't worry about looking smart or stupid. You know what you're doing wrong? 
you know what you're doing wrong. As I've said a thousand times, whenever I work with someone, I'm like, how am I going to figure out what this guy is doing wrong? And I had an epiphany 10 years ago or 15 years ago, whenever it was, and I said, you know what? I'm just going to ask. What are you doing wrong? Well, I'm not honoring my stops. <laughs> it's like, okay. <laughs> well, I'm day trading it. I shouldn't, I shouldn't be. And then the other story I've told is it a case where they won't tell me what they're doing wrong. It's, and they'll say, well, I, I've followed everything you said. I'm losing money. I want you to open up my brokerage account and tell me what I did wrong. And I try to avoid that at all costs. But one particular case, I was forced to do that. The client was very adamant about it. So I did it. And what did I find? He did take every trade. He did follow my plan. And he also took, and I forget how many, it was either 10 or 20. I think it was about 20 day trades in one particular stock. He made a few hundred dollars, didn't set the world on fire. And I know some of you guys are rolling your eyes right now. You've heard the story so many times, but it's just, it's a great story. He made a few hundred dollars following my stuff. And it wasn't a great period of time. I'm not bragging. Okay. And he lost $5,000. I said, Hey, I got some good news. If it wasn't for these day trades, you would have actually made money. Not much, but a little bit of money over that period of time. And his reply was, I know, I know. So we already knew. So, like Livermore says, we often make mistakes and know that we are making them. And that was in, uh, I think that was in Reminiscence of a Stock Operator. I couldn't find it, but it's somewhere in there. And if you do get around, if you do get a chance, uh, you, you definitely want to reread that book every year. And then you also want to read his biography. And then I think I have How to Trade Stocks here somewhere which I don't remember that one having a big impact on me, but the biography had a few little gems in it, which I thought were pretty good. So uh, a guy by the name of Smitten uh, wrote the biography. He, was, he used to live in New Orleans. I never did meet him, but he used to live um, at New Orleans at one time. And he wrote a pretty good novel, uh, The Man Who Made It Snow, which is a pretty good book if you want to read a novel. It's actually a true story. It's kind of fascinating. It's one of those books where you read it and you kind of sweat while you read it because this guy gets – sucked into this drug cartel type of deal. Um, I love those kind of movies and books. Anyway, before I digress too, too far, uh, Smitten wrote the biography. I remember it being a pretty good book. I can not I can no longer reach my bookshelf with my uh, headset on. I used to be able to do that, or I could find it for you. But um, I think it's just the biography of uh, Living More by Smitten. Make sure you read that. All right, so anybody could identify problems. How do you fix that? Okay, how do you fix these problems? Well, as I said last week and often, and even did a column on this, all you have to do is, whenever it comes time to fix something around the house, and my wife knows I'm, I'm fairly handy, so she does have a bit of a vote of confidence in me. And it is nice to have that vote of confidence. But all you have to do, it's like some little simple, quote unquote, simple plumbing problem. All you have to do is just tighten this up or whatever. Well, that turns into a lost day of my life. So what I'm trying to say here is a lot of times a lot things are a lot more easier on the surface than they are in reality. But all you have to do is three things. And if ever you get caught up plotting that 15th oscillator or holding on to a market and you're down 30%, provided that you're stopped, was not originally supposed to be outside of that range. But holding on, hoping, fear, despair, all these things we talked about last week, then just make sure you're doing these three things. Trade only when conditions are conducive to your methodology. WWJD, what would Jimmy Rogers do? Jimmy Rogers, one of my favorite quotes from Market Wizards was when Jimmy Rogers says, I wait until there's money lying in the corner, and all I have to do is walk over and pick it up. In the meantime, I do nothing, which I thought was brilliant. So, number one, trade only when conditions are conducive to your methodology. Number two, obviously, as I preach, plan your trade. 
where are you going to get in? And by the way, getting back to trade with only conditions or conducive to your methodology, the can't stand it test is something that I often say, if I passed on this trade, could I live with myself? So always take that can't stand it test. Is this really the greatest setup in the world? Okay. Is the market trending? Am I going with the market trend? Is the sector trending? Is this trend persistent one? I spent 14 hours talking about these things, and I spend sometimes uh, an hour or so every week in these shows talking about these things on picking the best setups. Okay. If, like I said to Colm not too long ago, like Jules said when he was talking about being able to uh, whether he would ever eat bacon. And he said it would have to be one charming pig. If you're finding a long right now, a buy side setup while this market is going down, it must really be one charming pig. Okay. So once you think you have the best setup in the world, plan your trade. Where are you going to enter? Where are you going to put your stop? Where's your initial profit target going to be? And how are you going to trail that stop? Now, I didn't want to go get too far into the discretion because that kind of set, that kind of suggests you're not following the plan. But if you do have a little bit experience, then it's okay to put a little bit of discretion. In fact, that can make all the difference in the world. But get successful on more of a mechanical basis and make sure you follow that plan before you add that layer of discretion. Now, I don't want to digress, digress too far. But by, disc by discretion, I mean that if your stop's at $10 a share and one or 200 shares trades around $10 a share and the stock never asks below $10 a share, is that the right word? Is it ask? ask? Yeah, or bid below, I forget. Never bids below, I guess never bids below $10 a share. No ask, I forget which one. I'm all mixed up right now. Anyway, if the market is really never below that $10 a share and your stop's right at 10, especially if you're coming in the day before and the stock closed at $10.10, you know around the open it's probably going to get hit. And it's okay to pull that stop provided you have a little bit of discipline. And worst case scenario, maybe lose $9.75 or $9.50, maybe an extra 50 cents on that trade if it does continue to drop. So that kind of discretion is okay, but you have to learn how to follow a plan before we even get to that more advanced technique. And I, I said I, I said to myself, don't get into discretion because you open up a can of worms, but once you're successful in following your plan, then it's okay to add that small layer of discretion on. And again, plan your trade, your entry, your stop, your initial profit target, your trailing stop, and then number three, just follow your plan, okay? I know, all you have to do. All right, Craig says, Livermore, money is made by sitting, not trading. Now, a lot of people have misconstrued that quote by Livermore. And there are those who are of the belief that what he meant was not necessarily sitting and waiting for a position to to work, which is something that's important. And I often talk about that in my dead money report. In fact, we've got one stock in the portfolio that's not profitable yet. And I think another one uh, also that it's profitable, but it hasn't a profit target yet. So when it does, I'm going to show, I'll probably put out a dead money report. But Livermore was talking about waiting for opportunities. And last year was tough. And I lost clients last year because we had a lot of action earlier in the year. And then the second half of the year, we were mostly just managing leftover positions and then squeezing off a short or two. And we weren't putting on a whole lot of longs. And we weren't doing a whole lot of anything for quite a while. And then what did people do? Well, they got bored. They went off to chase rainbows. They went off to lose money. Okay. Now, I don't know that, but in some cases, I'm sure they did. Number two, it takes time to make money. I agree. It was never that my thinking that made the big money for me. It was always the sitting. Yeah, that's the sitting waiting for the opportunity. Nobody can catch all the fluctuations. That makes a lot of sense. I, I wrote this in my first book, and the, my editor took it out. But uh, 
my wife had a friend came over. She's a little fella. She's not too big. <laughs> so wine really has an adverse effect on her. And she had a um, couple of uh, glasses of wine, and, and I came, I dragged my sorry ass in the house about an hour after the close or two hours after the close, whatever. And it might have been later in the night after doing all my analysis and all. And she, and she says, you look pretty rough. And I said, yeah, I got hit pretty hard today in the markets. And she goes, well, you know, markets will fuck you. She says, yeah, you know, markets will fluctuate. And I'm like, you got that right. They will fluctuate. But, yeah, nobody can catch nobody can catch all the fluctuations. And, and I have a bad habit of sometimes watching the screen, especially at something that's, that's more leveraged like Forex. And I'm saying, oh, I'm up this much. And, oh, now I'm down that much. Now I'm up this much again. I'm up this much again. Now I'm back down. And then. I think there's something inside of us that's thinking, if I could just figure out a way to capture every one of them little zigs and zags, you know, 10 times a day, $1,000, that's $10,000 a day that I'm up, I'm down, I'm up, I'm down. But the truth is you can't. And it's a lot easier said than done. So, yeah, you're right, Craig. Nobody can catch all the fluctuations. And number five, Limor said, the desire for constant action, irrespective of underlying conditions, is responsible for many losses in Wall Street, even among the professionals who feel that they must take home some money every day as though they were working for regular wages. Amen. Amen. I, I finally had to buy the Kindle version of, uh, of Livermore because these quotes, I keep looking for them, and I, and just, I end up flipping through my dog-eared, tired, tattered, beat-up book trying to find them, and sometimes they're really hard to find. Okay. All right. So the question is, hey, Big Dave, exactly how are you playing it? Well, here's the open portfolio, and you'll notice that in the open portfolio, we have... Minus one is a short, and plus one is a long. And I use minus one so I can make the math work in the formulas. By the way, if you want this spread, this tracking spreadsheet, I could give this to you. And you just put in your account size here. You put in how much you want to risk per trade. It tells you what you're going to risk. And then you put in the, the stop here. And then it gives you the amount of shares based on that stop. Okay. And then I put these in by hand, but you could certainly do a formula on that, which would be the entry plus this will give you this. Anyway, if you want the spreadsheet, just email me. I'd be happy to send it to you. So right now we have all shorts, and we had a couple longs in here, but we allowed them to get stopped out. And then the only setups that showed up were shorts. Now here we've taken partial profits. Notice that this part is white and this part is yellow. This means a half position is still on. Same thing here and same thing here. So we still have full positions on in this AIZ and the CCL until or unless they hit the initial profit target. So that's a spreadsheet. If you want that uh, tracking sheet, just shoot me an email. If you want this live one, I'll send you this one. Uh, usually I've got a, an older version I've been sending out, but I'll be happy to send you that one. All right, I'm ready to jump into the markets and take a look around. Uh, if you do want to follow the service and see that portfolio, about a week or so in delay. Lately, it's been a little bit further back because we've had some live signals that took a while to trigger. trigger. Uh, but about a week or so, you can see my delayed service, and it's 100% free. And then this way, you could follow along while you're learning if you're willing to give yourself some time. And then when you're ready to dive in, then of course I'd love for you to take the trading wheels off and start trading. He also said, buy right, sit tight. Really, you have to let them let the plan play out. Absolutely. And that's that's why I do a, a dead money report so often is because people get bored with positions and they say, well, that's it. I'm, I'm getting out. This thing is a... Uh, this, this stock is going down and the market's going up. It should be going up. So I'm going to get out. And then, of course, the market takes off the next day. Ferry says, or is it Terry? I need to figure out if I can make the font bigger on this. You can use the Ellie font. It's much bigger. 
I thought Livermore meant sitting on his position, riding longer-term trend instead of overtrading in and out of the market. Yeah, he meant both, but there was a particular quote where he said it's the sitting that makes the money, and he was referring to sitting patiently uh, and waiting for the opportunity to present itself. Remember this, anticipation is the ultimate power. Losers react, leaders anticipate. All right, I like that, Jay. Very good. ADHD, is that what I am? ADHD, or is that, oh, you want to look at the stock? Failure to plan is plan to fail. Very good. That's what Craig says. A parrot, average age, 40 years. Get a parrot, average age, 40 years. <laughs> Howard, break the Prozac in half. What are you talking about? Hey, Dave, Nick Raj, Aussie, Lake, W-O, be gone. Not sure what that means. I got that too. Jerry, you got to move around a lot? Yeah, I've got <laughs> uh, Yeah, I've got so many projects. Again, I got, I'm looking at my desk right now. I've got to finish in my office in my studio. My studio is not completely finished. I'm a bit of a starter, not a finisher, so I've got to – be careful with that too and that that caused a lot of my over trading at least early on because i tended to i was anxious to jump into trades often uh without a plan all right let's take a look at the market and you guys want to start asking about individual stocks feel free to do so now matt says yes livermore said sit and wait while the other traders create the foundation you would trade upon yeah uh he yeah he went on to say in that quote it's like um I wish I knew the whole quote, but he said, while you're sitting there waiting, those traders who are fighting it out, they're building the foundation for you. And if you think about that, that actually has a literal connotation. In fact, we could even look at the, uh, we could leave, this, it probably even translates to the overall market. So when the market makes a big base for a long period of time, this is where traders tend to generally agree on prices. So you get all these participants that generally agree, and then all of a sudden you get that disequilibrium in the market, and that's when your trends begin to develop. So I, I try not to get too sucked into to developing systems, although I did just yesterday. I was doing some very simple trend-following system testing. But I think one system that you could possibly trade would be to, step one, make sure market – does not trend for a given period of time, so it's due to trend. So I think there's definitely some fodder for research, and I've done that kind of thing before. But absolutely, because those traders who are fighting it out are building the base, and the bigger the base, the bigger the launch into space. Okay, uh, let's take a look at the P's. Let's take a look at a few areas, and then we'll uh, I'll start uh, keep the stock picks coming. If you don't mind, one, one uh, hit a put a symbol in, and then hit return. That way I, I could know whether I covered it or not. SP 500, kind of flatsville today. Not a whole lot to write home about. So far, we just kind of pull back in here. So far, a pretty serious slide remains in place. And I haven't measured that. I forget what that is. Anybody know what the slide is? Let's go. Let's find a high. Um, yeah, so that's a 12% slide in the overall market. And what I was testing yesterday, just – just FYI, I was testing what would happen if you bought and sold the market every time it went up or down 12%, 10%. And those numbers, I was going to adjust for volatility, but I figured that would make it more complex. I was just trying to make a point, which I might, you might, might find its way until um, these uh, webinars and speeches. But if you're looking at like my bow ties, on a weekly basis, look at a daily basis first. You've got a, a sell signal here, which is just shy of all time highs. So that's a legitimate signal. We did have a buy back here on a daily, but this is not coming off of major lows. So the signals that come off of major lows, as I've been preaching quite a bit, and go back and watch the pre prior shows, and I won't beat the dead horse too much on it, other than when you get a weekly bow tie off of all time highs or 10 or 20 or 30 year lows, it could be a fairly significant signal, and we've had some pretty serious bear markets that ensued after the market made all-time highs, and because the most amount of people are trapped on the wrong side of the market, and everybody's happy. 
then everybody has to start getting out and remember people sell stocks for a variety of reasons it has nothing to do with the overall market if you're putting a kid through college which isn't cheap I don't think you need me to I'm captain I'm captain obvious here right <laughs> you might have to sell some stocks and that has nothing to do with the market if you're thinking about retiring you still got a lot of money in stocks and that stock market starts going down those companies still might be fantastic companies but they're going down and your quality of life is going down with it so you might have to sell so people will buy and sell stocks for a variety of reasons as Tom McClellan's mother once said some people buy when they have money, some people sell when they need money, and others use far more sophisticated methods. And that's why a Holy Grail system does not exist. And I guess if it did, whoever owned it would own the markets. So we are getting a little bit of a pullback in here. P's are consolidating a little bit. You certainly don't want to rush out and buy them. We still are oversold, though, and I think we could have the mother of all bounces in this market would still be in a lot of trouble. But as a general statement, I think the trend is down. I think that's pretty obvious. You don't believe me, just draw your arrows, okay? The only good thing so far is that these recent lows, about 1,800 in the P's, are holding so far. But I wouldn't hang your hat on that. I wouldn't get too excited just because the market didn't take out those lows. When was that low? Back in... October of 14. I don't think that's much to hang your hat on. Let's take a look at the NASDAQ. Again, it looks like it's in trouble. This is a this is a weekly chart, and you can see that we do have a major sell signal in place here. In fact, this is kind of like a double signal. As I've said before, it's kind of like the second mouse thing. Sometimes you get these double signals or back-to-back -back signals, and the second one's the real deal. Uh, second mouse set up because the early bird gets the cheese. The second mouse gets the – I'm sorry, the early bird gets the worm. The second mouse gets the cheese. The rusty is indicative of what's really been happening with this market. We're down here towards multi-year lows, and this is what I've been seeing internally for a long, long time, especially since I had that sell signal last summer. And then, of course, I took some heat on that, telling me that I should probably find another profession. Well, I just believe in what I see and not always in what I believe. But you can see the Rusty 2000 major sell signal here off of weekly charts, off of all-time highs. You need to respect these signals, okay? I, I thought I would go a day without quoting Greg Morris, but I, I guess that's impossible because he said so many good things. Treat all signals as if they will become the big one, okay? So there's no guarantee that that weekly bow tie and the Russell will turn into the mother of all signals, but so far it has. And again, he who fights and runs away lives to fight another day. And once again, as Greg says, whipsaws are frustrating. Bear markets are devastating. Now, in the sectors, utilities have woken up in here, but if you back the chart out, they're kind of wide and loose. I'm not seeing a whole lot of excitement there. Gold, the stocks are beginning to wake up a little bit. Nice little base down here. Unfortunately, with gold, the stocks, and gold, the commodity for that matter, it's going to have a lot of overhead supply. doesn't mean that we're going to not go after stocks here. It just means that it's pretty hard to find a clean setup. And I tend to look for perfection Sometimes to a fault. Sometimes I'll take a trade and wonder what the hell was I thinking. But I do tend to look for perfection in, in a trade just because I don't want anything to muck up, anything obvious to muck up my trade because there's going to be plenty of unobvious things that can muck up my trade. I just don't want to buy a market that's getting ready to head into a big pile of overhead resistance. So uh, looking at gold, the commodity, we do have a bow tie off of multi-year lows. That's bullish. And so far, it's rallied nicely out of that. But Dave, how much did you buy? I didn't buy any because it's got overhead supply, overhead supply, overhead supply. And it's just going to have a hard time getting through all that. Now, maybe if it gets a little bit further up, I might begin to change my tune. But gold and gold stocks are about the only thing that looks somewhat interesting to me. 
Retail has me concerned because it's kind of the last of the Mohicans. It's one of these areas that's up at high levels. It's pulled back a little bit. It's bow tied off all time highs. Again, that second mouse type of signal, and now it's beginning to implode from that. So that has me a little concerned. Take a look at Amazon. Amazon, biggest retail of them all, beginning to implode. I've got asked, hey, Dave, what about shorting it? And I said, yeah, but the problem is you've got a lot of supply down here. Now it's made it to that supply. I'm sorry, uh, support, not supply. If you look at most any other sector, and I just like to look, what, look at what I call the major mid groups, downtrend, 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 down, 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 about to be down, 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 waking up a little bit, that's utilities, okay? Down, 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 down. So it's pretty obvious, at least from where I sit, that most sectors, that was tobacco, I wouldn't get too excited about that. Food's kind of hanging in there a little bit, but stalling towards, towards its old highs, and then down. So the majority of sectors are pretty obviously headed lower. It's not rocket science. Just draw your arrows, okay? You don't know how to draw the arrows? Okay, I'll let me just show you real quick. All right, here's banks. Just where are they now? The first thing you do is where are they now and just go back, go back a few months, okay? And then you just complete the arrow by doing that, okay? So the stock market's not looking so hot. Most sectors don't look so hot. We're a little oversold, do the bounce. I'm not seeing a whole lot of setups right now. So now we might have to sit on our hands and let things develop. Maybe gold will begin to rally from its lows a little bit more, and we'll start to see some setups there. And then last summer, I was thinking that the energies were bottom, bottoming out. But as I often say, it's always dark at some times before it gets more dark. But maybe the energies are trying to turn the corner in here. They just seem like they've been so beat up longer term. I would never rush out and bottom fish, but if I start seeing setups and energies, I'll probably take them. And then hopefully we'll see some clean setups in gold. I have saw some, I have seen some, as my wife would correct me, second tier cheap type gold stocks begin to take off in here. All right. Matt says, at what point do you start looking for setups and stocks already at downtrends versus bow tie initial rollovers? That's a good question, um, and I think you let the market do that. So what Matt's pointing out is he's he's on the service, so he's like, hey, Dave, um, you've been saying let's look at stocks in their first leg down, potential second leg down, as opposed to those in longer-term downtrends. For instance, if you, you use the market as your guide, so the market is still – this is leg one, okay, for all intents and purposes, probably the – Depends on how you want to measure it, but that's leg one. Now, we're not counting waves or anything. We're just pointing out that this is the first leg down. So when the market begins that second leg down and starts going down for quite a while, then we're going to start – we're not necessarily going to look for stocks that are in the, the trend resumption patterns and longer-term pullbacks, but that's all we're going to be left with. And, and which hats on the downside? Write that down. Which hats on the downside? are probably going to be a pretty good pattern to look for if this market continues low. I don't remember, but in the back of my head, I think 2008, we had a lot of witch hats to the downside that work really well. And the reason I like the witch hats in these established trends is because you have that sharp retrace that, that squeezes out a lot of people and the market rolls right back over a lot of times. So we'll let the market be the gauge, and we'll also let the database be the gauge. But right now, I'm still trying to find these stocks in the first uh, leg down. And if you take a look at the portfolio, uh, you can see, just for those who aren't on the service or if you're not on a delayed service yet, you can see that we've got stocks like AIZ. hadn't really paid off yet, but you can see they're just in the early phases of breaking down in here. Okay, CCL, this is kind of wide and loose, a little unorthodox. But it's in the early phases of breaking down. DY, okay, we already it's already made a nice leg lower, but we were going after it up here somewhere. But you can see it still has a long ways to go. MOH, we've been in forever. So it's it's for all intents, intents and purposes now in that second leg, but it was in the first leg uh, just recently. And then OZRK, 
has already hit the profit target. But again, this was another one we got in early because we, the signals were there, nice little bow tie off all time highs, right? And that's why we're going after these because they're just beginning to break down from high levels. And the bigger they are, the harder they fall, as opposed to going after an energy stock. I'll just pull one out, random Haas, Todd Hornback's company. Um, you know, we're not going to try to short Hornback offshore at this juncture. But maybe if the market continues lower, some of these banks, which would now be in their second leg lower, we might start shorting them. So uh, the, the answer is it depends, but we'll let the market tell us what to do, and we're going to let the um, setups do that. Parrots can last over 40 years and don't end badly, unlike many marriages or many other pets. PCLN. All right, individual stocks, PCLN for Jerry. Yeah, this is, stock, this is a stock that looks like it's in a lot of trouble. It's already pretty much imploded, though, from high levels. So this would be like a second level stock, but it still has a long ways to go. So I can't argue with that. Uh, maybe on a pullback, okay? But in this particular case, maybe a sharp retrace as opposed to generic pullback. Also, it's kind of lost a little downside momentum here. I'd almost, I was talking about the witch's hat a minute ago. I'd almost like to see like a stock like this shoot lower like that and then have that sharp witch hat type of retrace. Okay. Bob wants to know about AQXP. Well, at a glance, I'm not seeing much here. I don't know if that's some, um, this might be a reuse symbol. Looks kind of like an IPO. A little bit on the thin side, so I'd be careful. Uh, yeah, it's kind of rallied from lows, but it's just kind of up until this. Uh, it's got a little resistance above it. I would almost wait for this one to get maybe to like 16 or so and then reevaluate. I'm, nothing's jumping out of me just yet. Now, keep in mind, I'm going to be very um, picky on the long side. Thoughts on BAC bought at 17. Yikes. Okay. Jennifer was kind enough to admit to us that she did not have a plan because if she's a trend follower, she wouldn't have first bought at 17 because at 17, there obviously was no trend there. And I'm not trying to pour salt into your wounds, Jennifer. I just want to use you as an example, if you don't mind. So Jennifer, I'm going to ask you, let's be frank here. What was your plan? what point would you admit or were you going to admit when you got into this trade that you were wrong? And I guess the other question is, why did you get into it in the first place? Were you trend following? So I'll give Jennifer a minute to answer. We'll come back to her answer. But obviously this is a stock at a downtrend. And if, any, if anything, you've got a nice persistent downtrend. Sorry, Jennifer. Um, and then you got a pullback. Now, one thing that I've been noticing lately, which is pretty amazing and the, the Hang Seng, I've been looking at quite a bit for my uh, Chinese brethren. And the Russell's a little bit like this, too. What I've been pointing out is you usually don't get this persistency to the downside on the short side. Usually, market just implodes. It doesn't usually go down day after day after day after day after day. And when it does, it becomes, no pun intended, a bit of a Chinese water torture. And then you get a really big leg out of it. So that's what I'm seeing right now in the banks and that's what I'm kind of betting on with stocks like OZRK which are now in these persistent downtrends and BAC certainly fits that mold so uh, have a or if you don't have a place where you'll get out then then decide where you're gonna get out and just follow that plan and remember this stock was down at four bucks in 2012 there's no reason why it can't go back to four dollars a share okay a market can do whatever it wants. And then again, just realize if you get out, you get out. It might go up tomorrow, but that's okay. Have a plan in place because let's say you put it a stop at 12 and you get out no matter what, that's fine. It might turn around and go straight back to 18 tomorrow, but it could also go down to 4 and $5 a share. So it, have some sort of plan to exit it if it goes against you because it doesn't always go in your favor as you have painfully learned. But learn from this, okay? That's okay. I mean, it, it, mistakes are okay. Uh, you know, I think Livermore said that if you never made a mistake in a month, you'd own the world. But the man who doesn't learn from his mistakes will never learn anything. 
XON. This one looks kind of interesting. It looks like it's trying to bottom out a little bit, but it does have a lot of uh, resistance to get through, so I wouldn't rush out and buy that just yet. And again, you're fighting the overall market, at least at this juncture, okay? Terry says, on gold, GLD is going up, although the weekly is still making lower, low, and lower highs. Would it be better to, better to wait until it actually makes a higher low to get in? A higher low on the weekly? Well, again, like I said, I wouldn't rush out and buy gold, the commodity, just yet because it has so much overhead supply to deal with. Okay, now with that said, if you wait for the weekly to turn before you make a trade, then it's possible that you could miss the whole move. That's why I like to look at the daily chart. Uh, if intraday charts, 60-minute uh, charts are pretty cool to look at too, and they're kind of fun because it will turn. Markets will turn in the 60-minute long before they will in the daily. But unfortunately, the further you get down, the noisier it will be. So I, I like to, the, I like the daily time frame and look for turns in the daily. The problem with waiting for the weekly is that turn is going to take a lot longer to happen. Okay. And there's nothing wrong with that, but you're better off taking signals off of the daily. But Dave, don't you talk about weekly bow ties? I do. And I talk about them after they happen. And obviously in the S&P 500, when it began to implode last time, not, not this very last time, but it began to implode last summer, I was worried about the market back then. And we also had a daily bow tie back then. I think, or one that's set up back in here. And so I was concerned about it. And then I happened to notice after weeks and weeks of trading that it turned into a weekly signal. But I wouldn't sit around and wait for a weekly signal if you're going to trade because sometimes by the time you get that weekly signal, it's too late. So getting back to your GLD, um, I think it's already headed higher on a daily chart, so I'd focus on that. But again, it's going to have a lot of trouble getting through all this supply. So check back often. Maybe next week if we're up about 115 or so and it pulls back, I might change my mind on that one. But, yeah, just be careful waiting on that weekly chart. RJ says okay. <laughs> Susan says she's not just busy. She's, not, she's just busy. She's not mad at me. Okay, good. Susan says, morning, dream boy. Morning, Susan. MAA is a short for Susan. Uh, let's take a look at this. Well, it's a REIT. REITs can be a little choppy, but I and it is kind of uh, low in historical volatility, low in volatility. So it, it could turn into a setup. It's not a short just yet, but I hear you. It's kind of like, a again, it comes back to the last of Mohicans. When these REITs begin to crack, they could provide some opportunities. I'm not a big fan of selling shorting REITs or sell, uh, trading REITs, but I hear you. It looks like it's in the early stages of crack. It's a little wide and loose, though. Craig says, I see where we're at as an opportunity, but you have to hang with Petty waiting. Yeah, and the waiting is the hardest part. Susan says, I paid lots of uh, tuition. All of us have, Susan. Welcome to the club. Andre says, HMY. HMY is one of those second-tier gold stocks I've been talking about that's been going up. And we had a really nice bow tie back here, a little bit of a pullback when it was a penny stock. And so far, so good. So, yeah, on the next pullback. Right now, I wouldn't just... I'd be a little scared to just jump in midstream, but on the next pullback, absolutely. Good eye, Andre. RJ says, if you could look at MPWR, I'd be happy to. It has a bow tie off the top. Today they announced earnings. Do earnings call for any action? Well, I ignore earnings. Uh, well, first of all, it's kind of thin for shorting, and you might want to check your broker to make sure you could even get shares on it to short. So I wouldn't short it because it's a little too thin. I'm a little scared to short thin stocks because they get pushed around quite a bit. Um, I guess your, sell, your short would have been here, and then now it's kind of chopping around. So I would leave it alone, but I think you're right. I think the stock's in trouble. It's just not set up. NDX and RUT. Do I have that chart? Yeah, NASDAQ 100. Yeah, NASDAQ 100, kind of interesting. you got a gap down here. I guess you could say this whole uh, trading here is a big gap. 
Big Island Reversal. Is that what they call that? I'm sure the candle people have a name for it. Um, yeah, it looks like it's in trouble like everything else. Let's take a look at Apple, which is used to be like 20% of the um, NDX, or the Qs at least. Apple's had a pretty serious downtrend. If it takes out 90, it could be even in more trouble, but it's a little hard to trade Apple. It trades kind of all over the place. Yeah, we talked about the Russell already. Uh, Japanese lint yin long, XJY, XJY, or is it FXN? FXN. Or FXY. FXN, no, FXY. Um, well, it looks like it's trying to bottom out. But it's kind of all over the place. It, it tried to bow tie. Um, based on, if you're just reading the bow tie on this, your bow tie from this all-time lows, at least for this contract, would have been back here. And so far, that bottom remains in place. But it's not a setup. I don't see a setup. But, yes, it looks like a bottom is in place. Good eye on that. Hi, all in New Orleans. Hello, Phil. I need to come visit you when I make it to the U.K., I'm waiting for a tour, a tour dates to be set up. Let go be gone, effect overestimate one's abilities, a well-known Nick Raj trading story. Oh, let go be gone, effect overestimate one's abilities as a well-known Nick Raj trading story. Okay. I don't know about that. I'll have to look that up. I guess I need to tell Nick I was talking about him today. I don't want to bring up the negative thing, though. Just sold it. Hope I learned my lesson. Okay, Jennifer, that's fine. Yeah, I don't want to. I don't want to. Remember, everything I'm doing here is for educational purposes. So don't sell a stock because I said I'm questioning your trading. Sell it because you've come to the conclusion that hey, if I'm a trend follower and I'm down 70% in a stock, maybe I'm no longer a trend follower, especially a stock that's not a, a volatile stock that is known to make volatile moves. Oh, sorry about that. It was recommended by an online market writer should have used a 10% stop. Well, I don't know their reasoning, but I'm a trend guy and I just use charts and I try to avoid any, any reasoning other than what I'm seeing in the charts. But I do, when I put out my trading plan for uh, my trading service, I do have a stop in place in case I'm wrong, because guess what? I'm wrong. Quite a bit. And I'm one of the few guys out there that would admit I'm wrong. So, yeah, if, you, if you're if you using some sort of fundamental analysis like this gentleman may have that recommended it, then what do you do now? Well, it's at $10 a share. It was at 15 or 17 So fundamentally, it's even better now. It's cheaper, right? So you, just, you should buy more. But at what point do you throw in a towel? And that's the problem is there's never a point where they admit they're wrong. Don wants to know about Lulu, Lululemon. Uh, it's headed higher, but it's getting ready to hit a mountain of overhead supply. And guess what? The overall market's not doing so hot, so I'll leave it alone. Yeah, this one's kind of all over the place. It's become a really big stock now. MAA for my friend Susan. Yeah, we talked about that one. I'm sorry. Uh, Don wants to know about Smith & Wesson, SWHC. Love the guns, hate the stock. <laughs> I think Smith's now in trouble. I was bullish on Smith back here. We actually had a buy signal in here in the service, and then I took it off because it was too many days of the pullback. Of course, the next day it took off. That's fine. I can live with that. Uh, it looks like it's in a lot of trouble. Unfortunately, it's got a mountain of supply. I'm sorry, support just below the market. So it looks like it would maybe go down to 18 and find a little support. So I would avoid that one long or short for now. FCX, Freeport, Mac Moron. Uh, I think the downtrend is still in effect here. This big blue arrow is still pointing down. Back to draw way out. Let's take a look at like a weekly just for S&Gs, okay? Um, and it's trying to turn a corner, but I wouldn't rush out and buy it just yet. Even if it does begin to turn a corner, like a lot of stocks, like a lot of metals, it's going to have a lot of overhead supply. I guess it'd be a good problem to have if it made it to $10 a share. But I'm just not seeing it just yet there. Susan wants to know about V, as in Visor. 
yeah, this looks pretty good. I, uh, I guess your your sell trigger would have been here, but I think it's still in trouble. Uh, I think you could do a lot worse. So I think it's okay. Uh, it did hit a lot of times. I like them to hit new lows with a lot more vigor. Like I would prefer it if it came down to maybe 68 or lower before pulling back. But I hear you, Susan. And uh, this is a stock that's in a lot of trouble. We got a nice little gap down here. Uh, it, I think it's it might be worth a shot. I know what Phil's going to do. He's going to wait for it to kiss that 50-day moving average. Thanks for your insights today, Jim. Oh, you're welcome, Jim. I I have fun doing this. All right, we're going to have to wrap it up soon. Let me get a few more in. Yeah, see, here's a, another example of these gold stocks are really beginning to wake up in here. So, yeah, maybe on a pullback. Now, here's the problem, though. It, it's it's gone so far so fast. But, yeah, that's not too far. So, yeah, on a pullback, NEM might be worth a shot. Good, uh, good eye, Steve. Steve's our resident musician here. Chart for NOV, NOV. Uh, no, that's in a downtrend, obviously. Just draw your arrow. So wait for it to uh, start going up before trying to buy it. Uh, you know, in the case of, like, the oils, it's kind of like uh, a uh, Will Rogers market. Um, if they don't if they don't go up, don't buy them. Okay, ADHD. Are you saying I'm ADHD or is you want to look at ADHD? I'm probably ADHD. <laughs> uh, it's kind of all over the place. I, I think you were talking about me being ADHD. Is that what that is when you're fidgety? I, I definitely have that. Yeah, okay. <laughs> um, yeah, this this is kind of reminiscent of a reminiscent of a, a kind of a witch hat. You see how the sharp retrace back. Not a perfect setup. But I really can't argue with it. It's a little wide and loose. But, yeah, I hear you. It looks like it's headed lower. I think you could do a lot worse. Some can go to zero. Yeah, stock could, also, stock could always go to zero. I mean, uh, as I wrote in Layman's, there was a bank that was established in, what, the 1800s, 1854 or something, that, that went to zero in 2008. Um, it was a big boy. I forget exactly who. It was one of the big, big guys. They even have an SNL skit on it. It was funny. Matt says, excellent show lessons. Thanks, Dave. Oh, you're welcome, Matt. Anytime. I, again, I'm having a blast. Okay, uh, any more? We'll squeeze one or two more in real quick before I shut things down. While I'm at an impasse, I want to thank you guys and girls for coming. I appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule to be here. As you can tell, I have a blast doing these, and this is the highlight of my week. So I really enjoy doing this. Uh, going once. Anyone else? Going twice. Right at the last minute, somebody always gives me one. No, nope, maybe not. Okay. All right. Thanks, everyone. Uh, again, thanks for coming. Any questions, daviddavelandry.com. If it's not a quick answer, I'll use it as fodder for next week's show, which is which would be great, too. I'd be happy to cover it. Uh, keep an eye out on YouTube for recording of this. And uh, everyone have a fantastic weekend. If we don't talk again, hope to see everybody again next week. Thank you so much.